Support for Carolina Business Review made possible by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. You know, it may not be spoken directly, but the daily references to courage, or maybe the lack of courage around public leadership right now is deafening. Welcome again to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and on this broadcast, some of the issues surrounding our precarious public financial situation and political situation, and of course, our current business. And later on, Furman University boss, Rod Smola. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also by King and Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded July 8, 2011. On this week's program, Robert Orr of the North Carolina Institute for Constitutional Law. Grady Johnson of South Carolina Business Publications, LLC, and special guest Rod Smola, president of Furman University. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome again to our program. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Happy weekend. Thanks, thank welcome you. back. Good to have you both here. Uh, Judge, I, I want to start with you. Let's start philosophically here. You know, it, it seems like partisanism is getting worse uh, emotions are running high. I certainly understand, you know, when, when the well runs dry or we run, we run out of money, you know, things have to be cut and, and tempers are going to flare and, and, and uh, emotions are going to run high. But, you know, it, it seems like during critical times, then the right leadership steps up. And uh, you're hard-pressed. Is it me or is, is, are we hard-pressed to find those who have the political will or maybe the moral courage to stand up and take the heat and make the, the decisions that we need made? Well, it appears to be that more and more people are unwilling to do that, to make the really tough decisions. And in part, we live in an attack political system in which uh, all you have to do is mention reforming Social Security or Medicare, and, and out of the woodwork comes all of these people uh, saying that you're trying to deprive the elderly and, and, and people of these benefits. So I, I think it becomes more and more difficult for political leaders or business leaders to really make the tough decisions. Grady. I also think, um, you know, being a part of the media, uh, I also think the media plays into this a lot. It, you know, the 24-hour news cycle, um, you know, democracy in action is it's kind of like watching sausage being made. I mean, you know, you're better off not looking sometimes. And, and there was a time when a lot of these deals were cut uh, out of the public eye, simply, and, and, and technology now has enabled <coughs> everyone to to observe what goes on much closer, and it makes it more difficult for someone to stand up and, and cut the kind of deals, do the kinds of things that, that could be done in the past. Well, okay, well, let's get to this internet age, and let's talk about this for a second. When a blogger has the ability to video and arrest a police officer arresting a citizen on their phone and post it on their blog, that is a gray area. Uh, recently, uh, a blogger was arrested for doing that, along with the, the other person who was arrested. So what does that say about uh, this new age we're in? This is probably a good issue we want to bring up with, uh, with Rod Smola right. later as well. But, uh, Bob, I'll go to you first. What, what are we talking about? Here? Well, people in politics are never safe. I mean, you think about former Congressman Bob Etheridge, uh, who, who was filmed in a confrontation, perhaps set up, uh, that probably cost him the election. And so uh, no one is safe to say anything, anywhere, or do anything uh, that you don't run the risk of having it uh, photographed, recorded, 
And I think that's making a lot of people uh, more hesitant to, you know, to be candid about issues and, and, and the like. So is that, is that more about full disclosure or is there something else going on with, with the consumers of all this media, all of us included? Grady? Well, I, you know, it's I mean, still you also... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but how okay. do you think about when you're, when you're publishing one of your papers or you're posting something on your blog or you're posting something for, for, you know, for publication every day? You, you have to be very thoughtful about what's going on. And I think, I think that's, that's where we are right now is the technology has, has leapt past our ability for all of us as a society to be thoughtful. It's, it's still, in my opinion, it's a new toy. And, and, and people are playing with a dangerous toy sometimes. And, you know, it's the old argument about, you know, media and editors and, and what have you is, is as a consumer of news, the, very few people understand the thoroughness and the thoughtfulness that goes into uh, publishing something. And, uh, uh, and, and we still goof. I mean, you know, we, yeah. we make mistakes all the time. At least we have that sort of layer of thoughtfulness that somebody does something and posts isn't trained to do. I, I heard a discussion last night that said news used to be that which was important to our society. Now it's controversy, uh, celebrities. That, that's what's driving sales mm -hmm. and readership and viewership. And uh, so the, the whole concept historically of what we've thought of as important news is getting left behind. I wish we had more time. To, I really, truly do wish we had more time to peel back these layers. I want to get to another hot issue going on right now in both North and South Carolina, redistricting or what they call reapportionment, and that, and that is the redrawing of some of these congressional districts. And I'm assuming it's not just the federal representatives from the states, but also the state legislators as well. Right. Bob, where are we with that? How, uh, how uh, polarized is that process, and what would you expect it to look like? Well, for the first time in 140 years, uh, the Republicans control the redistricting process in the legislature in North Carolina. And, of course, you have a Democrat governor. She can't veto their plans, but they've released the voting rights districts, uh, the congressional districts, the other districts uh, for the House and, and Senate will be released shortly. But there's already uh, promises of litigation. And it's all about power. Who draws the districts? who's going to uh, have the advantage in the next election. And it, it, you could almost say it's the Lawyers Relief Act because there's going to be a ton of litigation in North Carolina. Do you expect the Republicans are going to be more magnanimous about how they draw the districts based <clears throat> on some of the heat the Democrats have taken over the years? <laughs> well, I, magnanimous may not be the right word. I, I think there are certain restrictions, one person, one vote, they have to be careful about how they draw the voting rights districts. Their state constitutional provisions they have to follow. It, it, it's really a pretty difficult process. But invariably, uh, the question will be how many safe districts can they create for Republicans uh, and how can they minimize safe districts for Democrats. And, and Grady in South Carolina, redistricting going on as well. Is, mm -hmm. does, is redistricting driven by political power, or is there some type of balance that needs to be redrawn, if you will, no pun intended? Well, I mean, it's about population, obviously, and, and you know, the, the two things on the table is, is uh, I think the Senate version of it is uh, Oree County gets a, a new seat, and uh, uh, in, the, in the House, it's uh, Beaufort County, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I'm just looking at it from a journalist's perspective, I think it's all about electability. And so I think, I think the folks who, are, who, are in, who have the power to redraw those districts are gonna be looking at it as a, uh, you know, as a tool to use to, to, to elect whoever can be elected. Now, it's a strange thing in that, at least the way I understand it, most redistricting occurs with an incumbent somewhere in the middle. This, in South Carolina, this is a new district. It's a seventh. Uh, it's a seventh seat, uh, so so it's something new, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's a, that's an interesting thing to watch how how it all plays out. I mean, we just you know from my perspective, we're gonna have to watch it and see. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't heard so much about the litigation side of it in South Carolina. I think it's more of a uh, you know just just figuring out who's most electable from my from my. Perspective. North Carolina is pushing for an independent redistricting process. That would take a change in the Constitution. Mm. It, it, it would because I think, the and, and our guests certainly will be talking about this, if you have all of these safe districts and very few 
uh, truly competitive districts, you diminish the political discourse. Uh, and so the more competitive districts, the more the candidates have to sort of reach out to a broad spectrum of voters uh, in order to be elected, right. and you only get that with a truly independent process. You, you know, we, we, we've made a uh, we've made reference to our guests, so we're we're going to have to bring them into the dialogue here. <laughs> uh, guys, stay with me. Coming up in this program next week, Lanier Cancellor is the Secretary of Health and Human Services in North Carolina, the single largest agency in the Tar Heel State, uh, and also the 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 administrator, if you will, of of Medicare and Medicaid in some cases, and certainly healthcare dollars. And then coming up in a few weeks, uh, a very interesting dialogue by the CEOs of some towns like uh, Charlotte, Anthony Fox, Alan Joins from Winston-Salem, and Steve Benjamin, who is the mayor of Columbia, will be here. He has had the job now almost exactly a year, widely thought of as one of this nation's premier voices for freedom of speech, the freedom of press, and academic freedom. He is a lawyer by formal training. He is now Furman University's 11th president, Rod Smola. Mr. President, welcome to the program. Glad to be here. You know, Rod, I know you've been sitting off set and listening to some of this dialogue. So, you know, let's start in with it. Where are, let, let me go back to the philosophical questions, if you will. You know, as the, as the rhetoric gets more heated, as the decisions, quite frankly, get more important, where, where is the civil discourse when it's needed most? Yeah. You know, we've always had a tradition in this country of wide open debate. And that goes back to the founding of the republic. But there's a different quality now, and we've already alluded to some of, the, some of the reasons for it. On the one hand, it's a kind of golden age of expression. You've got thousands of media outlets uh, because of the Internet. You've got a proliferation of uh, cable television channels. You've got great shows like this. You've got uh, voices in which people can, on their own, start a blog and get a following and, and become contributors to the debate. So all that's on the good side, but there's a sense that not only is our politics very polarized, but it's often paralyzed. We don't seem able to break log jams. There's a very, very strong element of personal attack that seems to seep into politics with a, a greater vehemence than it, than it has at other times in our history. Uh, there's a sense of a lack of accountability, uh, often because on the Internet, at least, people can hide behind screen names and people will just pop off uh, and, and say the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, Things like Twitter, as wonderful as they are, they, they tend to reduce your thinking to a sound bite and, and the juicier the better and the meaner the better. So you have all these things that, that combine to um, give us this feeling that th the way to behave in our society is to be as funny and mean, as controversial and biting as you can, and to be just cocksure of everything, just to think you've got the right answer and you've got it all figured out. And so I look at the young folks that come up into our universities, and they've been brought up in a world in which they think that's the way you behave in a democracy, that my job is to, as a freshman in college, think I know everything and have the right answers to everything, and I'm, I'm strident, and the rougher I can be, uh, the more effective I can be. And over the long haul, that's just not good for a democracy. It's not good whether you're in a state legislature or, or on a... On a television program mm -hmm. or, um, you know, trying to solve problems at the community level uh, at, at your local school. Um, and so I think the, the institutions in our society that kind of form the culture, uh, those that appear on television, those that uh, are professional journalists, the leaders in politics that you were just talking about, and universities, which have a real powerful ability to, mm -hmm. to shape the way people learn to deal with one another and talk, have an obligation to, to, to society, have an obligation to the democracy to say, you know, um, what we've learned over history is that the great leaders, the great thinkers, don't believe they have it all figured out, don't believe they're always right. And a lot of them, their, their greatest strength is that they could listen. They could listen, they could reflect, they were occasionally willing to be persuaded to change mm -hmm. their mind. And, uh, you know, you, you look at famous figures in American history, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, as a lawyer, Lincoln's greatest strength, folks would say, is he could put himself in the shoes of the opponent or the other side and understand where they were coming from. And, and that's why he was an effective counselor. That's why he was an effective advocate. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a long answer, but I think that those of us in, in positions of responsibility um, have an obligation 
to do better <laughs> and to cut it, to step it, you know, take it down a notch and teach the young folks that are coming up through our school systems um, that that's the better way to solve problems. And, and you know, I want to give you a chance here, Bob, but just a quick follow up with that, that uh, President Smola. Is, uh, is our public dialogue forever changed or is this a pendulum that will swing back toward the wise uncles? And those I that... think it will swing back. I'm optimistic about the history <laughs> of our country, about our abilities to, to, to correct things and our traditions of checks and balances. And, and I think that there is a kind of backlash and resentment. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be seen at the ballot box. It'll be seen when people like us say, you know, we, we need a little more reasonableness. So I, I, I do have some confidence that it's not changed forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, the, the Internet is a transformative force, and it does have some elements to it that, that are, are a kind of new game and, and, and learning, to, learning to create some of the old forms of responsibility and community and accountability in this new ether that we have where everybody can talk is really one of the challenges of the future. John? Well, I, I just have to say that last point about the challenges for the future I think it's right on. I mean, there seems now to be no boundaries uh, on what people will say in the media, in uh, public forums, and, and there has to be some uh, going back to the, the boundaries and limits that we had. But, but can I ask my yeah, question please. about, yeah, well, um, Mr. President, uh, you have the unique role as both a constitutional scholar uh, but also as part of your responsibilities as president to run a Division I sports program at Furman University. We've recently had a lawsuit in North Carolina where a former player has sued UNC and the NCAA. What, what rights do you feel these student athletes have or should have uh, in this huge economic engine that's college sports in our nation? Yeah. You know, I was once a football player, too, right. Justin, and, and the one right they don't have is to not run the play I call from the president's box. <laughs> <laughs> if I phone Fair one enough. down, they better run it. <laughs> there are, your question's a great one, and uh, if, if we think in terms of constitutional rights, what, what rights does the football player have to say my due process was violated or my free speech was violated or my freedom of religion was violated? First, it's going to matter whether it was a state university or a private university. So although we don't think of this in our society, mm -hmm. you do as a lawyer, but most of us don't think of it, it would matter whether it was a Duke player or a Carolina player. If it's a Carolina player, that player is at a state university and the state has to respect constitutional rights. So there are some limits. Uh, the NCAA is a different animal. The <laughs> Supreme Court held in a case that arose out of uh, the famous uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas coaches' problems, Jerry right. Tarkanian's problems, the, the Supreme Court held that the NCAA was a private entity, not a state actor. And so there's no constitutional rights that a player has against the NCAA. Now, some of that's technical because even if you're at a private university, you may have certain contractual obligations to the player. So, you know, in theory, these lawsuits are not frivolous. Now, I'm not commenting on the right. underlying merits because often when you dig down into the underlying merits, um, there's not much there because whatever the university did or whatever the coach did was justified. But occasionally, obviously, there are abuses and then uh, they get enforced. One, one other nuance is that Title IX has a giant influence on a lot of the behaviors of coaches and universities in sports, public and private, and for things like... Uh, like sexual misconduct and harassment and that sort of thing, uh, if a player is a victim there, uh, they have very effective remedies under that federal statute. Fair. How about switching topic to, to cost of education? Uh, you know, uh, everyone is focused on, uh, on rising costs, and, and as, as you are quite aware, states are cutting back on education. It just, it just seems, uh, you know, to be more and more competitive, it, you know, we need a, a well-educated workforce. Um, you know, just kind of crystal ball for us, you know, do you see an end in sight or, you know, as, as a college president, what are you, what are you thinking yeah. about? You know, I, I saw a very interesting piece, and there have been, there have been quite a few recently comparing the housing bubble uh, to higher education and mm. suggesting there may be a higher education bubble. And I think that the, the, the reflex answer that 
a university president's likely to give is, oh, it's really not so bad, and these, these problems are overrated, and education's enormously important, and we've got to have a highly educated workforce to compete, and so on. Uh, but I'll give you a little different answer. I think that we do need a different set of business models. I think there is a kind of a bubble. Uh, I'm fortunate to be uh, the president of a, a, a great, great university. Uh, but our tuition, like another 150 universities in this country that are private universities, uh, when you add tuition and room and board and so on, it's about 50000 a year. Very few American families can afford that. Uh, and state university systems in the Carolinas and around the country are in tremendous distress because of the fiscal distress that states are under. And so it's, it's going to be the job of universities, public and private, to figure out ways to deliver very high quality education and the kind of character building that we can add, not just not all intellectual building, but the kind of character formation that we can be involved in more efficiently. We've just got to be able to do it. Uh, we do it in a way already at a private university like Furman because although our sticker price is $50,000 total, we give out huge, huge sums of financial aid. We, we gave out $43 million in financial aid this year. Uh, but even that is a bubble that, mm -hmm. that's going to burst at some point. That becomes unsustainable beyond a certain point. So looking for ways to deliver quality education in more efficient models is something we've all got to not be defensive about and be creative about and look for better, better business models for the educational product. Do you think it's a combination of like two and three and four year degrees, something like that? that you, you know, I think it's going to depend on the, on the nature of the student, the kind of career they're going to want to pursue, uh, and, and how they're going to contribute to our society. But flexibility like that makes a great deal of sense. So here in, in, in the upstate of South Carolina, which we're not far from here, you've got uh, enterprises like uh, BMW that may need a highly skilled workforce, but they don't necessarily need someone with a four-year liberal arts degree for the kind of work that they're doing. Right next door is Michelin, which has an international uh, headquarters there. They have a more white collar, more professional workforce demand they need. They, they need well-trained people who have a broad exposure to a lot of disciplines and, and are probably gonna need a four-year degree or a postgraduate degree. And there certain professions like law and medicine and so on, you just gotta put the years in in order to, mm -hmm. to, to get through all of the various things you need to, to do to be a well-rounded professional. But you need flexibility and, uh, and I think the notion that we're all in this together and that technical colleges and community colleges the flagship state universities, the other state universities, and the great cadre of private universities that we have. Um, although we compete on football fields and basketball terms <laughs> and we compete for students, we're all part of an infrastructure that's really the, one of the great strengths of the country. It's one of the few places that where we have a lead on the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Still, we have a magnificent system of, of, of higher education and and we've got to work together to, to make sure the, the access is there and the affordability is there. And, and let me back into that, uh, Mr. President. L let's, let's back into that for just a second. We have less than two minutes left. But uh, USC now gets less than 10% state funds. You know, here's, yeah. a, here's a public school that right. pretty much is, is not going right. to be a public school soon. You've got Carolina, North Carolina, that is, right. uh, University of North Carolina system now, $400 million less in their budget this year as voted by the Board of Governors. So as USC looks at this Greenville hospital system tie up, is that going to be tabled now? No, I think, I think it's going forward. And, uh, and I think, the, in fact, I happen to know that the uh, most important next step of accreditation for that uh, medical school uh, is about to be cleared and happen. Mm -hmm. And I think the deal's going forward. Actually, it's the <coughs> kind of public-private partnership that has promise, in my view, for state universities. And so um, I, I'm, I'm a partisan. I've, I, I support it. Uh, I think it's a positive thing for, for uh, the upstate part of South Carolina, and I think, it, I think it's going to sail through. So, so, so Rob, that won't, be a, that won't be a casualty. That'll be an example of what we should be doing. I think it, that's exactly the best way to put okay. it. All right. Yeah. Uh, we're out of time. Thanks for being on the program. My pleasure. Would you come back since we I'd didn't be get delighted. to the character issue yet? Your dancing with the students oh is, is important to talk about. <laughs> Thank you for being on My the program. My pleasure. Uh, Grady, always good to have you. Thank you. People don't know much about this surfer from Charleston, but we're going to talk about that too. And, and Bob, thank you. Judge, always My good pleasure. to have you on the program. Uh, thank you for watching our program. Uh, until next week, I'm Chris Woody, and we hope your business is good. Have a good weekend. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton.
an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also by King and Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. Additional funding provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services. With more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by viewers like you. Thank you. You may write us at Carolina Business Review, 3242 Commonwealth Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205.